Hey everyone, Rob here, and what you're about to hear is one of the final episodes of the Crooked Table podcast. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere, but the show in its current form is coming to an end. Still, from the ashes of the Crooked Table podcast will rise the era of Crooked Table Productions. Starting this summer, we'll be launching three brand new shows. These include Showstoppers, a seasonal show spotlighting two actors. In this first season, my lovely wife Kai and I will shine a light on the careers of Jim Carrey and Drew Barrymore. Franchise Detours, wherein a guest and I will discuss the many twists and turns of a popular movie series, including our upcoming mega series on the Child's Play movies. And finally, this feed will transform into Close Watch with Robert Yanis Jr., in which I get to know a guest through the prism of a movie they love. But that's all coming up. For now, let's listen in for one of the final times to the Crooked Table Podcast. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast, where we discuss the world of film from a fresh angle. And now your host, Robert Yanis Jr. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. On this episode, I was thrilled to be joined by Jeremy Scott, co-founder and voice of cinema since to discuss his new book the state of cinema and of course his popular youtube channel it was such a blast getting the chance to talk with jeremy about his success as a creative person you know commenting and and critiquing with the humor involved the movies that we all love so it was a really fun opportunity to get a chance to talk with him and i hope you all enjoy listening to this episode and the insight that he brings so without further ado let's jump right into my full length interview with jeremy scott of cinemasins today i'm joined by jeremy scott the co-founder and voice of cinema sins as well as the author of the new book original sin from preacher's kid to the creator of cinema sins which releases may 18th jeremy it's a pleasure to have you here thank you thank you for having me it's it's an honor i'm always uh, humbled when people want to hear my voice well i mean that's yeah that's something i was about to point out too it's like as a a fan of cinema sins it's uh, it's a little surreal to hear your voice uh, in person like this well, uh, I, I do get that from time to time. And, I would uh, imagine. <laughs> I just, uh, I roll with it. And uh, I, I've met people that want me to send them on the spot. They want me to just start riffing and like mocking them. And I'm like, ah, I need a little time to research. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take some improv classes. Maybe you get sharpen that up. So next time, exactly. next fan encounter, you're ready to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so obviously, Cinema Sins, you know, more than 9 million subscribers, over 3 billion views, uh, a bunch of other YouTube channels you guys have going on. And I, I'm not going to put you on the spot as far as tips and tricks for YouTubers, because obviously, I'm sure that's the probably the question you get most asked, in addition to send me on the spot, I guess. Uh, but one thing I was wondering, like, with everything that's been going on in the industry and in the world lately, like... How has uh, how has the pandemic kind of uh, has it impacted you know CinemaSins operation and if so have you kind of course corrected? Oh, for sure it has. Um, you know, uh, I'll probably get in trouble for saying some of this, but I don't really care. Uh, the first few months we were doing fine um, because the the initial behavior for a lot of Americans who were um, staying at home and not going anywhere was to go online and watch YouTube videos or Netflix right. or what have you. Um, <clears throat> but then the advertisers started suffering in their own businesses and started redirecting their marketing dollars or cutting their marketing budgets. So we saw our revenues go down pretty dramatically for most of the summer. Um, and then <clears throat> sometime late fall, they YouTube, to protect their own revenue, uh, just turned on mid-roll ads for like all new videos <laughs> oh and you have to go in and opt out of those if you don't want these mid-roll ads. And <clears throat> so we get a few fans that were like, Hey, your, uh, your videos never had mid-roll ads. And we were like, Oh, what's going on? So we investigated, but we also noticed that the mid-roll ads had shot our revenue back up to normal levels. Um, oh, okay. And uh, that's why you've seen articles the last couple of weeks about YouTube beating their first quarter projections of revenue. Well, it's because they turned mid-roll ads on for every video, um, not because they got more views than they did the previous quarter. Um, 
And of course, we already all work from home anyway. So our, our day-to-day operation wasn't directly impacted. Um, but, you know, we certainly felt the pandemic. Um, the other way it affected us is without new movies coming out in theaters, there's less general movie chatter online. Right. And you'd be surprised how much um, that drives traffic. Um, you know, so let's just say if Wonder Woman 1984 had come out in theaters when it was supposed to, well, there would have been a Cinema Sins video. There would have been an Honest Trailers. There would have been a How It Should Have Ended. There would have been a pitch meeting. And th- those all would have flowed views to each other through YouTube's recommendation algorithm. Um, but because there's so much less of that kind of content now, um, all those channels are seeing, us, us included, are seeing fewer views than we would if there were five new movies every week in the Cineplex. Right, right. And and you mentioned in the book that you uh you you know you work off of the Blu-rays for for the videos. Is that still the case? Because if so, there's hasn't been a lot of uh, as you were saying, you know, 2020 big releases. Uh, Wonder Woman 1984 is like one of the only ones. Um so I, I you yeah. know how how have you kind of switched it up for that? Um, yeah, we still use the Blu-rays. So, um, you know, there's a reason we just send Jerry Maguire. I noticed that. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I was like, what's his latest video? I was like, oh, okay. Nostalgia stuff. You know, that's, that's probably the best way to go in, in this, in this kind of environment. Yeah. I mean, we, we can only do what we can do. And, you know, from what we're seeing, it's on track to get back to normal in a few months because theaters are opening up and, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're crossing our fingers that post pandemic, we're going to come out looking even better. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody's getting vaccinated and everything, even in Florida, a notoriously uh, red state. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned that you spent a lot of time uh, early in your life working in movie theaters earlier, you know, during the late nineties, early two thousands, I was an AMC employee for over two years myself. So oh, well. coming, fr- coming from that perspective, what, you know, what are your thoughts on, movie theaters like long-term like how do you think it's gonna all shake out in 2021 and beyond i think you're gonna see studios uh, buying movie theaters um and i think you're gonna see some kind of big player that's not in movies right now fully um i keep i keep thinking netflix is gonna buy a chain and use it for theatrical distribution of their own original films. Mm -hmm. Um, A a buddy of mine thinks it's more likely to be Amazon or Walmart that ends up uh, tapping into that market. It's definitely going to be a change because everybody lost money hand over fist, uh, filed for bankruptcy. Um, So all the theaters are hurting. But the good news for theaters is that the studios, I think the pandemic has shown the studios need them. They need the theaters. Um, it's just, I think you're going to see them tighten control, um, on distribution by, by just going straight ownership. Cause there used to be a law against that, but that went away a couple of years ago. So now there's, there's nothing to keep Paramount from buying Regal or AMC or what have you. Mm. And, um, and then you can exert market dominance over your studio foes who don't own their own chain. So then they're going to all own their, I think that's probably where we're headed. Plus I think for awards contention and such, there's a lot of eligibility, like it has to play in a theater for at least, you know, a week or whatever a number yeah. of theaters. I forget what the, I feel like the rules are constantly changing on that as well. And if Amazon or Netflix has their own theaters, like, no, no, we played it. It was in our theaters, yeah. <laughs> you know, this yeah. many thousand theaters, whatever. And so there's that no gets more that. need to jump through the, the hoops. Uh, if you just have your own, you know, end to end, you know, from production to distribution, you own the whole thing. Exactly, exactly. Which on on one hand, as a, you know, faithful theater goer, I'm like, don't don't change my movie theater experience too much. Keep that alive. But as far as accessibility to films and and uh, variety of content, I think that's there's a lot of there's a lot of good things, I think, about this sort of hybrid theaters and streaming, uh, you know, model that it seems like everything's moving towards. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. Well, you've seen just the last 10 years, you've seen so many theaters go to luxury seating or uh, really expand their menu options or even 
you know, have waiters in some theaters that come and serve you while you're watching the movie. And I think exactly. you're only going to see more and more of that premium experience type of thing for sure. Yeah, I think so too. So one thing that I wanted to definitely touch on is you mentioned in the book, and obviously this is, is very, it's very popular on film Twitter for people to debate, you know, this whole cinema sins backlash, obviously, you, you know, sure. all about this. It's you call, you touch on it pretty directly in the book. Uh, how, how's that affected? First of all, how's that affected you? And even like the direction of the channel? Do you, do you consider yourself critics? I, I mean, I know a little bit more than the general public because I have read the book. I finished it last night. So it it's, you know, maybe speak to that for people that, uh, that sure. Um, it doesn't, it hasn't changed anything about the way we go about things because thankfully my, my co-founder, Chris, uh, Atkinson is just very stubborn and, uh, in a good way. <laughs> I mean that in a good way. Um, we're not going to change what we do right. because some people either hate it or misunderstand it. Um, you know, I don't think it's healthy for anyone to read mountains of, hate tweets and hate mail. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. And so it was probably only a year or so into the channel when I just stopped reading comments under the videos. I just don't, I don't read them anymore. Um, and, um, you know, that's better for my mental health, but what I try to focus on is that it, we have had success, uh, and we're obviously very grateful for that, but nobody that has success does so without accumulating some hate. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody. Um, so, you know, like one of my favorite examples is Coldplay. A Coldplay is the butt of a lot of jokes. When people want to make a joke about music being bland or boring, they, they make the Coldplay joke, right? Coldplay sells out arenas. They have number one albums every time they release. They're like hugely popular. It's just, yeah. they're also the butt of the joke from the people who aren't, super fans or what have you. So I try to see what hate we do get as evidence of the success we've had and view it in that light. Uh, certainly people are entitled to their own opinions and uh, what we do is not for everybody. But to one thing you said, uh, we do not consider ourselves critics. At least uh, the videos are not serious film criticism. On our podcast where we don't play a character and we're just ourselves, we will sometimes review films um, or offer critiques, but even then we're not professional movie critics. We're just fans who like to talk about films. Yeah. I think it, it's just over the last year, and this is probably just a symptom of the pandemic. It feels like online vitriol generally not, not, you know, not related to your channel specifically, but just generally on film Twitter, like everything is just constantly like the end of the world. And, yeah. I, and, you know, obviously your, your channel takes some, you know, there's some poking going involved in there. You mentioned about like uh, labeling the videos, everything wrong with. There's some right. stirring of that conversation. There's sure. a little bit of uh, some mild trolling. But what I love about I love about what you said uh, in the book about how it's it's more like coming from a, a, a such an intense fan perspective that you're you're just obsessive over every little detail. And it's 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 kind of goes back to that whole thing. It's that it. it it doesn't make sense. People don't fixate on things that they, I mean, well, some, I shouldn't say that. Some people do, but people should, people, healthy, healthy, mentally balanced people don't fixate on things that they absolutely hate. They fixate on things because they love movies. They, they you know, they even one of your, one of your videos that I, I watched routinely over the past several years is The Room because uh -huh. I, I, we, my wife and I, we use that as a, as kind of a touchstone for like, you know, uh, about Denny being a creepy bastard and things like that. Like we, yeah. cause you, cause you encapsulate everything that is weird and wonderful and confounding about that film. And like, you know, I think it's uh, less than eight minutes. So yeah, I, I think that that's, that's part of it. And I think people just see the headline, they just see the everything wrong with, and they're like, Oh, they're tearing it apart. But it's, you know, as you mentioned, there's some, some of the things that you're picking on are just like how long the logos run. Obviously this is not to be taken seriously. There's, right. there's a, a mountain of salt that goes with this air, air quotes criticism. Um, when I but, was yeah. younger, I was a massive Star Trek, the next generation fan. I still am. Um, and there was a book in high school my brother gave me for Christmas called The Nitpicker's Guide to Star Trek The Next Generation. And it goes episode by episode and finds every mistake, 
every time data says a contraction, which he's not supposed to be able to do, uh, every time the pins on the uniform are wrong, um, who, who buys that book? It's not people who hate Star Trek The Next Generation. Exactly. It's people who've seen every episode 10 times and want to celebrate that obsessive nitpickery over this thing they love. And, and that is sort of a parallel to what we're doing. Yes, the titles, everything wrong with, definitely put people off. Definitely people see enough of that in, in their feed without watching the video and they get a picture of us that's not accurate. But um, yeah, if you watch the videos, we try and make it pretty darn clear. Like in the James Bond one, we said Idaho isn't a real place. Um, <laughs> and we got like hate comments like, you bastards, I live in Idaho. You're so stupid. And I'm like, okay, but that was the joke. But all right. Yeah, it's like when you see when you see something on social media and clearly someone's just messing with you and then everyone's comments are you and then the joke flying right over their heads. It's like yes. it's completely that encapsulated. And you do your, you know, to your point of of the success of the channel and if you type in cinema sins on YouTube, not only do you get a lot of your videos, you get everyone doing videos about your videos or yep. or kind of their own version of it or uh, you know, flipping it and having doing like the positive side of different films. Like it, it, you've inspired so many uh, imitators, essentially. What is what does that feel like to to see how how many channels have sprung up trying to basically ride on cinema since coattails? It's weird, man. Like I don't think so. <laughs> it's it's I if if I was twenty years old when this had happened, uh, uh, it would have been very bad for me. I would have. I would have made all the wrong decisions with this kind of, you know, video success. Uh, I would have probably gotten offended. I'm just, I'm just old enough to be mellow. And I see there are, there are people that do our thing on other content. There are people that do our thing on our content. Um, and I, I can't bring myself to get offended by it. I, again, it's just another sign that, we're, we must be doing something right. And uh, that feels good. So yeah, younger me probably would have gotten hot about it, but you know, it's just, it's, it's all of that feeds back onto us anyway. So it's ultimately good for our bottom line. Yeah. Flat. Well, imitation is the, the most sincere form of uh, flattery they say. So, exactly. I mean, I think that's definitely on on the money. Uh, you also mentioned earlier and also in the book about how the the air quotes voice of cinema sins is really more of a character than necessarily representing your own views on a film. Obviously, a lot of it's comprised of jokes and the like. So, and you also I think mention how frustrating that is that you're it, it, at various points have felt kind of boxed into that role because people are so used to hearing your voice yeah. to the point that when we started this call, I was like, Oh my God, it's the guy on the videos, yeah. you know, which, yeah. you, which you constantly get. And is there, is there, you know, I, for first of all, a couple of things, one, do you, are you still kicking around possibly a long-term plan to try and switch that up? And secondly, how do you keep yourself fresh doing the narration after all these years, is, do you have sort of a, a routine that you do to get yourself in the mindset? Do you drink a Red Bull? Like what is, <laughs> what is, kind of, what is kind of your, uh, you know, your approach to that after so long? Uh, my wife would tell you that um, I, I have a good pout for about 30 minutes before I go back into the studio to narrate. I, <clears throat> I don't want to look my gift horse in the mouth. I'm very, very happy with where we are. Um, but I do hate narrating now. Um, and when you started, when we started, I didn't have any idea it would ever become, you know, the work feeling part of what I do. You know, writing, mm -hmm. writing these videos is still 100% fun. Um, but when it comes time to narrate, it just feels like work. And I have to gear myself up for it with a good pout. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I would say long term, I still have plans. Now we we have we have switched over the narrators on music video sins and TV sins. That's two of our subsidiary channels. It used to be mm -hmm. me narrating all of it. Um, now Barrett narrates music video sins, and Aaron Aaron uh, narrates TV sins. That takes a lot off my plate. We also just started commercial sins, and Chris is narrating that. 
So long term, the idea is the, the core SIN fan is used to all four voices, and we can start hopping around from channel to channel. So yes, long I have not really talked to anybody about that, but long term, I would love to take a two month break and have the other guys rotate to narrate the sins videos. I think the fans ultimately uh, would enjoy that, but uh, we've got to choose the right time. I think too, having the the podcast and having the hardcore cinema sins fans or, or um, you know, I guess sins fans at this point, since you have the variety of channels, uh, getting used to everyone's personality and everyone's voice just kind of only helps sort of smooth that transition over. Yeah. A podcast was such a great idea. And, and I resisted it for so long, but it, it has given us a place to share our real opinions. Um, and for those fans that care enough to look, they can easily differentiate, you know, the videos from what we really think. Um, and uh, yeah, again, you know, the more they listen to us, that we're we're good friends, the three of us. So it's our our podcast is really just three of us shoot the shit about movies, and that is something people enjoy and they begin to feel like they're part of the group and they get to know us. And so, yeah, if Barrett pops up on a future cinema sense video, there's a portion of the audience that'll be like, what? And then there's a portion that'll be like, Barrett, my man. So <clears throat> yeah, exactly. choose the right time. So assuming that doing the narration, which, you know, you said feels like work, assuming that's one of your least favorite parts of the job, what's your favorite part of the job? Um, the fact that I get to watch movies and write jokes um, for a living. That's my favorite part. I hate staff meeting. Um, I hate narrating. Um, I don't like giving notes. Giving notes is what I call when the editor sent a video back and we have to go through it looking for spelling mistakes or inconsistencies between the footage and the narration. And that feels like work. Um, but when I open up a movie and I open up you know, a word processor, and I start writing jokes. Uh, that's my very favorite part of it, for sure. Do you usually do that, like, on the, the second viewing of a movie? Or how, how does that even work? Like, do you watch it to absorb it, or and then watch it again to do the jokes? Or is it some sort of a simultaneous thing? It used to be multiple watches, um, usually two or three. And I would have the Word document open both times or all three times. Um, but over time, what I have done instead, I only go through the movie once, but I stop and go back and rewatch scenes a lot while I'm doing that. So I still end up probably doing two or three passes. I'm just doing it sequentially instead of, you know, watching it all the way through three different times. Um, but yeah, if I, if I go 10 minutes and I don't understand something or I haven't written anything, I'll go back and rewatch that 10 minutes again and re-scrutinize for something I can write. That that makes sense. Sort of editing. It's also kind of writing and editing as you go along because obviously a lot of the videos have running gags throughout the course of, of the sin count and things like that. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, I was really fascinated in the book by, you mentioned about how you weren't really, you weren't really exposed to a lot of movies growing up due to, yeah. you know, growing up the the son of a preacher and then kind of a religious upbringing. Do you, and this is something I can kind of relate to because, uh, you know, growing up, I was really into movies before I started doing this, obviously. And and my dad would just, you know, my parents would be like, oh, you know, do, do something more useful with your time, that kind of thing. And I, I think at a certain point I grew up and I was like, what if I make watching movies and talking about movies and writing about movies, my, my you know, if I start making money that way, can't really, really criticize it anymore. So do you feel like building your career around, as you were just saying, watching movies and even naming it cinema sins is, is sort of like you kind of making up for, for lost time earlier? Oh, maybe. Now the name uh, goes to Chris. Uh, and, and Chris and I spent about a year trying to come up with YouTube channels about movies that would maybe take off. And we failed several times, but uh, I came up with this pitch you know, what if we did the comic book nerd from The Simpsons um, riffing, nitpicking a movie in a Micro Machines commercial, really fast style speaking. Uh, and Chris was like, oh, yeah, this is great. And I was like, no, what do we call it? Like movie mistakes, or film flubs. And he said, cinema sins. And, and that came out 
immediately. So that part is not a reflection on my religious upbringing. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, the way I describe it is like Fred Flintstone, right? Like my feet were spinning, but the more traditional non-movie watching upbringing was holding me back, right? And then when mm -hmm. I got to college, it was like it let go and I was off to the races. Um, and I, I think I said in the book, but within, within a year, I was managing at a movie theater um, and watching everything that came out. And I just couldn't get enough. And I don't know if it's directly because I was denied it so much. But, but, you know, what's interesting is that there were these breakthrough moments in my youth where, where we did get to see Return of the Jedi in the theater when it came out. And I had only seen the first two uh, at home on TV. And there was that was viewed as, you know, harmless enough. Let's let them go see that. But it was so magical. All I wanted to do was go back and see all the movies. And yeah, by the time I was 18, there was no stopping me. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned specifically uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day being the one that got you hooked on movies. I kind of have a theory that every true movie person has that one film that really kind of crystallized their, their passion for cinema mm -hmm. for me was the matrix. And uh, I think we were probably roughly, I, I was 16 when I saw the matrix. I think you were probably roughly the similar age with Terminator two. Uh, yes. How conflicted were you with recording the cinema sins video on Terminator two? <laughs> were you like, Oh, oh no. boy, here we go. <laughs> well, not, not at all actually. And what's funny that the matrix was that film for that. The matrix is my favorite movie of all time. Um, and we've done that. Um, and I just, I actually get more of a kick out of narrating when it's a movie that I truly love. It just somehow helps me get a little more emphatic. Um, so, and, and Terminator 2 uh, was the one that, you know, set me on fire for movies for sure. I'd never seen anything like this. And I, I, I gather a lot of people who saw that movie had never seen anything like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize movies could be that big of a spectacle um but it has not ultimately it's not in my top 25 movies of all time despite being the one that sort of lit my fuse um i love it it's great don't get me wrong but i uh, there are other movies have snuggled in closer to my heart you know that that being said what would you consider the the sort of ideal movie for cinema sense to do a video on is there a, is there a balance you try and and strike between you know, movies like The Room that are so easy of targets or, you know, obviously the big blockbusters. Is there like a, a sweet spot there that you guys try and aim for? Um, it really depends. I mean, we do try and have, we used to do a lot of math, honestly, just um, we want to have this percentage of decent, you know, film takes, this percentage of uh, throwaway joke sins, this percentage of intentionally ignorant sins. Uh, we don't do that so much anymore. It's more on feel. Uh, and of course, as we have hired more people, we've gotten more perspectives, more voices. Um, so some of the running gags have changed over time. Um, <clears throat> but um, I completely lost track of what I was saying. That's that's good radio right there. I apologize. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So I, that makes sense. I mean, I think at this point, you guys are so you're so well established within you know your fan base and your subscriber base that it. I think at a certain point of certain percentage of the subscribers will just follow you along with whatever you decide to send. I, I could see how now it's just more like, Hmm, what, let's just, we haven't done that. Is, is there anything you haven't sent that you really uh, want to get to, or you're like holding off on because for, for any particular reason? Um, no, but this would have, this would be a better question for Chris uh, because he is the complete owner of the schedule. Um, and so I'm conditioned to just not even think about it. Um, so, and I also have a terrible memory. I, we play this game sometimes where somebody will throw a movie out and I have to guess if we've sinned it or not. And I'm always wrong. Um, <laughs> we've been doing it for just long enough. Did we send that movie? I can't remember if we send that movie, like uh, dirty dancing. Uh, we send that movie, but, uh, I don't remember doing it. Um, <clears throat> so I let Chris do all the schedule and I've just, I don't even think about it anymore. I just look at, I look at my tasks and go, oh, I have to write sins for Harold and Kumar now. Um, as far as what rationale he uses or if he's got any in his pocket that he's holding for one day, I do not know. Is, the, is there anyone specifically that kind of stands out to you either because of, you know, you're really proud of the script that, that you that you wrote or or the response to it or anything like that? 
Well, yes, uh, there's an answer, but it's going to frustrate your listeners because I don't think this video is viewable right now. I think it's in a claim process. Uh, but uh, the movie Sinister with Ethan Hawke. Right, right. Um, that was like one of the first horror movies that I wrote Sins for. There's something magical that happens with a horror movie when you write Sins for it where because our thing is really basically taking everything in a movie seriously, right? Or overly seriously. Um, and when you do that to a horror movie, they become absolutely ridiculous. They become bonkers when you just start taking everything at face value. Um, and so I laughed a lot uh, making that. Well, this was back when we were still doing all the editing ourselves too, but uh, writing and editing that video up, that's probably the video I've gone back and watched or rewatched the most just because I had such a good time. That one, and I'll give you another one uh, that is viewable. Uh, the Cinderella, the Disney animated 1930s something Cinderella, which is another bonkers movie that is more about mice than you remember. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, something that just got gleeful about taking shots at such a simple, harmless, uh, beloved classic. Uh, Wizard of Oz was equally fun uh, for the same reason. It's like this is adored, and we're just making these stupid comments about it. I mean, it's, there's a lot going on in Wizard of Oz. Like it's a very weird movie. If you take take away your, uh, I guess, ruby colored glasses uh, yes. from that from that movie, just like you know, witches and and munchkins, and there's a lion and a scarecrow, and it's it's a very strange movie objectively. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, obviously Hollywood has kind of gone all in on franchise filmmaking lately, mm. the last decade, at least it, we, mm. we're kind of living in the age of the shared universe and Marvel's kind of running the, the whole uh, table, basically. Is mm. there, is there a point as a, as a movie fan, is there a point that you think that a studio should just pull the plug, move on? And how many Fast and Furious movies ago do you think that was? Yeah. I mean, I, for me, you know, my perspective is always about creativity and originality. Right. Um, so I don't enjoy the Fast and Furious movies, but the studios are approaching it from, a, you know, dollar standpoint. And those movies make bank. And so they will continue to make Fast and Furious movies until one of two things happens. Until they stop making money at the box office or until the stars of those movies demand so much money that the studio can't make money by paying them and making the film that's the only thing that can kill franchises these days i don't you know audience has to get tired of it or the star has to demand too much money um and i'm not a huge fan i understand it as a financial decision um i really do and if i were the ceo re reporting to stockholders i might make the same decisions but from a a guy who writes stories and tells stories and, and, and values originality. It's a frustrating time to be alive. But in addition to the franchise-itis, it's this, now we're in this era of nostalgia reboots of Full House, Karate Kid, and Mighty Ducks, and it's, everything is getting rehashed. Mm -hmm. um, and that is almost worse than sequels and franchises <laughs> to me. It, it is very... I have a good friend who argues with me about this all the time because his his perspective is, as long as it's a good movie, why, why should I care? Um, but I always tell this friend, well, if you wrote books uh, or original stories or screenplays, you might have a different understanding or perspective um, because it just sucks. It just sucks to keep seeing headlines that, hey, this movie that's already been made three times is getting made again. Like, like Steven Spielberg is making West Side Story. What the <laughs> hell are yeah. we doing? Uh, and then I the, saw the the reactions to that after they, you know, they put the trailer on during the Oscars yeah. and some people were like, oh, this shot. And I'm like, but I have it sitting on my shelf. Like, I've seen this before. Like, the, the, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I don't understand that one at all, man. Makes no sense <laughs> to me. And it's kind of two pronged. It's the the rehashing, which I've, you know, I've, I've seen kind of... Uh, referred to as the legacy sequel or the requel, like basically the force awakens kind of thing where it's the new mm. hope, but again, with younger people kind of carrying things forward 
or yeah. it's the shared universe Marvel model. So either way, <laughs> either way, it's Mickey Mouse's fault. Uh, yes, it is. is the, <laughs> to kind of balance things out, uh, as far as the franchise conversation, real fast. Is there a is there a, a movie franchise that is still running that you're like hell yeah bring me more of those? Oh well, I would love to see another raid movie. Um, oh god, me too. I don't think we're ever going to get it um, for various reasons, but the raid is amazing. But the second one uh, just took it up a notch for me. I that was one of the most visceral movie experiences of my entire life, um, and the way that camera doesn't cut away during the fight scenes is incredible. Um, so yeah, that might be one. Um, I'm, I don't know, man. They all, they're almost all suspect to me <laughs> <laughs> until, <laughs> until I hear it. Like, okay. So the Lego movie, we get that announced and everybody rolls their eyes. They're going to make a movie based on Legos, but then it comes out and it's amazing. And we're all like, oh, wow, Lego 2 is going to be great. And it was just kind of average. And yeah, I, I just don't know that we have a lot of steam <laughs> in most of these stories. Oh, Paddington, uh, the Paddington series. I think Paddington 2 is perfect. Uh, the greatest movie I, of all time, apparently, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing. Well, apparently, yes. Um, I love it. So I'm down. They're making a third one. So I'm down for that, too. Um, but there aren't very many that I would personally green light. Yeah, yeah. It's it gets very samey after a while. Like even with the the Marvel and Star Wars things, even the ones I enjoy, I'm kind of like, yeah, but you're riffing on this thing. And, and I agree with you as far as originality is concerned. Uh it, what do you think though is the cardinal sin of movies today? Like is there is is there a particular uh is there a particular sin or nitpick that you find yourself constantly having to talk to talk about in videos where you're just like, oh man, we gotta point that out again. Is there yeah. something that you're seeing really common? Well, I'm going to give you two answers. Um, one, everybody does, and it's the opening logos. And mm. it drives me bonkers. I get it. But when I buy a CD, when I buy Taylor Swift's newest CD, I don't have to first listen to an ad for Big Machine Records or Interscope or whoever the hell she's signed with. right? I just get to listen to the first Taylor Swift track. Um, there's no reason. It's the only medium that does this. Even television production logos come at the end of the credits after the show. Um, but somehow we decided collectively it's okay for the movie to open with 60 seconds of shameless advertising for the money man to feel good about themselves. And it's it, it's not part of the movie. It should be moved to the end. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. But in terms of the cardinal sin... Uh, it's a big umbrella and there are many types that are underneath it, but it's not following your own rules. Um, I'm a viewer. So you, the movie, you get to tell me what the rules are. You don't have to tell me any rules you don't want to, but if it's, <clears throat> if it's a rule and you've told me, then you need to abide by it throughout the whole movie, uh, not set up one thing and then later on, uh, break your own rules, uh, inconsistencies, I guess, mostly in story. I'm not so concerned about like, uh, oh, you can see the director's reflection in the glass. Like that to me is not a big movie sin uh, as much as, uh, you know, the writing of inconsistencies. Uh, that really grates on my nerves. Yeah, no, I just, an example popped into my head with um, with Star Wars to go back to that because again, everything's Disney. Uh, it's kind of the difference between Harrison Ford's reflection in the plexiglass in Return of the Jedi when he's running away from the uh, whatever, I forget, the thing that's about to, the shield generator or whatever. Uh, that and somehow Palpatine returned <laughs> where it's just like the movie's just like, no, this is happening. How? Yeah. We don't know. It's, it's just, we'll explain it in a comic book or a novel. Don't worry about yes. it. It's just, yes, it's aggravating. We, or We or got like Ian McDiarmid back. When Wonder Woman starts flying in wonder woman 84 yeah flying she's flying i don't uh that's not you broke your own rules movie wonder woman <laughs> doesn't fly Jeez. um let's see so you wrote a, a series of books called the ables about teenage superheroes disabilities and it's kind of inspired i guess 
at least according to the the press kit I was given, uh, your experiences with hearing loss, anxiety, depression, and you, you don't really touch on that in Original Sin. Is that something that you're you would want to maybe delve into a little more down the line, or is it or is it something too personal? No, I writing Original Sin was a very interesting process for me because the, the Abel's, as you mentioned, is fiction. Um, so I have to come up with the characters, the story, uh, the settings, the dialogue. But when I'm writing about things that happen in my life, I don't have to make anything up. Uh, mm-hmm. I just have to write it down. It, it's all in my brain. It's all already there. Um, and it was good for my mental health to get some of this down on paper, I think. But there are other Jeremy stories of other varieties that I would like to tell. So I think if this book is successful, this is my journey with movies. So Mm -hmm. it's over three phases of my life, being a preacher's kid, managing a movie theater, and then cinema sins. But the book is mostly about my relationship with movies throughout all those times. Uh, I could see myself writing a book about my mental health journey um, or a book about um, coming to grips with my hearing loss. Um, Maybe those two would be in the same kind of a book. I'm not sure. Uh, But those are not stories I chose not to tell for any reason other than this book is mostly about movies. Um, and if I had started talking about hearing loss or my mental health, I would have derailed the whole book and right. uh, ended up making it all about that. Right. Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. It makes sense that you're just, this is sort of, you know, uh, obviously a lot lighter focusing on movies, getting, getting all these stuff that fans of cinema sins would want to know about the guy that, co-founded CinemaSense, the voice of CinemaSense. So that makes sense. Are there any, uh, are there any kind of fun or memorable stories that you, for whatever, whatever reason, p- pertain to the book could have been in there, but just were kind of trimmed either for length or just, uh, you know, clarity or anything? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, those were just, uh, what I did was, I, I did an outline before I started writing and I just brainstormed stories from my life uh, from these three eras that were about movies. Uh, so I wanted to tell the story about um, going to see a few good men and getting busted because my buddy lost his wallet. Uh, and I wanted to tell the story of going on the cattle drive with my friend Josh. And these all were basically written down in a bullet point list. So when I was brainstorming the adventures Chris and I have had uh, with Cinema Sins, uh, what's in the book is basically just, you know, the first 10 to 12 stories that came to mind. But we've had some other adventures, some that I probably can't tell without permission. Um, but there wasn't anything that I cut out of the book, uh, if that's what you're asking. It was really more right. of uh, I made the decision of which stories to include before I started writing. Okay. Okay, cool. So there's potential for not only a more, you know, a, a more personal story of, of your life and sort of hearing loss and stuff, but also possibly a sequel to Original Sin. I mean, I, yeah. it sounds like. Oh, uh, yeah. People, Although in a yeah. perfect world, I'd love Chris to write it. I'd love to see what stories he wants to retell from our adventures. Um, but yeah, could happen. Cool. And speaking of Original Sin, and of course, I'm talking about the 2001 erotic thriller starring Antonio Banderas and Angelina <laughs> Jolie. <laughs> Uh, I have a story there... about that movie. <laughs> oh, are you willing to share? Oh, uh, sure. I built that movie. This was back in the days of film and you movies would come in canisters on six or seven or eight reels and you had to splice them together. Um, that's what building a movie is. So when you build a movie at that, at that point in time, you had to watch it to make sure you didn't make any mistakes with the splices. And right. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but it is insane. And Like, it's her, it's Antonio Banderas and Angelina Jolie having lots of wild sex for, like, an hour. And then it cuts to her in, like, a nun's outfit in a jail telling the story to somebody. I had to go upstairs and make sure I hadn't gotten a reel out of order because it was such an abrupt turn in that story. Um, I literally walked upstairs, stopped the movie and checked my reels to make sure I hadn't put them out of order. And that's the only time a movie was ever that nuts that I thought I had made a mistake. Nice. So kind of, kind of jumping off of, of your, you know, your, your breakdown of the bizarre structure of original sin. Are there any, any plans to do a video on that? Cause I'm seeing kind of a, a, a tag at the end of the video. Oh, speaking of original sin, why don't you pick up my new book now available, now see, on, you know? 
where were you four months ago? That's a great idea. And we should have done that. But we're, our production schedule is so far ahead. It's too late for me to slide that well, in. The book will still be out four months from now. Just starting That's out true. There. That's true. Get an extra true. bump in, in sales. That's a good point. Why did not think of that? And that movie would be awesome to sin because it's crazy. <laughs> it's a crazy Exactly. Movie. Exactly. You can take that one for free, Jeremy. Go All right. It. Thank you very much. The check's in the mail. <laughs> Um, just kind of winding down here, what's next for you? Any upcoming videos or other projects you, you want to tease while, while we have you? Absolutely. Uh, I am finishing up, uh, a murder mystery book. Um, it's actually was due to the publisher yesterday, but instead of sending it to them, I'm taking the weekend to tinker with it. Um, but it's not like anything I've ever written. Uh, my other stuff has been young adult or nonfiction, and this is a straight up murder mystery set in the rural Indiana in the 1980s, which is where I grew up. And that will be out summer of 2022. Um, and then I have a fourth Abel's book that'll be out after that. Uh, that is my next project. Uh, but in terms of videos, let's see, there is one coming up. I'll give you, I'll give you fans one tease. Um, we decided to send happy Gilmore to coincide with, the PGA's U.S. Open this year. <laughs> um, and uh, I hadn't seen that movie in a while. And it's pretty crazy. And uh, I had a lot of fun writing sins for that and narrating. And that video is already locked. And it's a good one. So um, if your listeners care, keep an eye out for that one because uh, I think it's special. Awesome. Awesome. That, that sounds really, that sounds really fun. Uh, obviously, Jeremy, you know, people can find your stuff on CinemaSins on YouTube, but where else can people find you on social media? I know you have your own YouTube channel uh, that, I, and I did, by the way, catch your, uh, your promo for, for the book, which was really, <laughs> which was really fun. Um, <laughs> anywhere other than CinemaSins and the other channels on YouTube, you want to direct people? Um, well, uh, let's see. No. Um, I mean, we have TV sins now, commercial sins, music video sins. Uh, I don't post on the Cinema Sins Jeremy channel very often. Um, and you can find my personal Twitter is uh, at jscotttn. Um, and of course, Twitter at Cinema Sins. I manage that uh, account as well, but it's a little more business snark focused. And uh, my personal, I show you pictures of my cats and give you writing advice. <laughs> so. Nice. Awesome. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's It's been such a blast to talk with you. And, you know, just as a longtime fan of CinemaSins, I, it, it, I really appreciate you taking the time. And this is a fellow creative person. It's I'd really admire kind of not only what you built on YouTube, but also that you're finding time to write all these books in addition to everything. It's just I, I really I, I want some of what you're having because it's really it's really amazing that you're able to kind of balance all those things. And Meanwhile, I, meanwhile, I'm kind of just like really impressed. So uh, well, congratulations on all of that. Uh, best of luck on your continued success. And obviously people should definitely pick up Original Sin, which will be released on May 18th. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for watching the videos before you ever got this interview. And thanks for reading the book. Um, I really appreciate your time that you invested into this interview. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeremy. So there you have it. That was my interview with Jeremy Scott, co-founder and voice of CinemaSins. Big thanks to Jeremy for taking the time to discuss his book and his YouTube channel with me. Uh, it was a thrill having him on the show. And hopefully in the future of the Crooked Table Productions, we can get more interviews of this uh, of this caliber kind of going and get some more guests on uh, in the YouTube and or creative space in addition to our normal format. So keep an eye out for hopefully more of that in the future. But for now, uh, as, as we go through this last round of episodes of the Crooked Table podcast before we switch things up later in the summer, we're going to be posting the Howard the Duck episode with Jamie Williams. That will be up in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. They have about We have a handful of episodes left before we, uh, we start switching things up uh, probably around July or so. So stay tuned for updates on that. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at Crooked Table. Uh, find Instagram, the same handle. And uh, of course, go to crookedtable.com 
for all the episodes of all the shows we're going to be having in the summer of 2021 and going forward. For now, I've been Rob. Keep it crooked, everybody. This has been a production of CrookedTable.com. All rights reserved. C-R-O-O-K-E-D. <laughs> <laughs>